Hello! Hey! Welcome. Welcome, welcome well, to our live Q&A. Yes, welcome. Uh, super excited to be here with all of you. Thanks for coming today. Something brand new for us. Um, we're trying to do this a little bit more, get out there uh, and, and kind of bring you into Wistia and tell you about what's happening behind the scenes, what we're learning and, and what's new in our world. So thank you for coming today. It's also worth saying that uh, if you've watched Wistia videos before, uh, you may know that they are almost entirely scripted. Um, <laughs> So this is a new thing for us, and we're, we're really gonna excited. be off script. We're gonna yeah. be off script. We'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> we're here in the studio today, um, broadcasting to you live. We've got Chris Levine over here. We've got Maria, um, Ramia, Ramia, Maria, <laughs> Maria. Is that your name? Uh, who are you? Maria has explicitly told us that she will not. She does not want to answer any questions. So if you have questions for Maria, please put them in the chat. But um, she will not be answering them. She'll, she'll answer probably. We'll try to get her to answer them. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> Um, so we wanted to do this Q&A basically because we published that post a couple weeks ago about bringing on debt, uh, buying back investors, getting in liquidity for employees, like why we decided to do this. Um, we got tons and tons and tons of questions in the comments on that post. We also got, also got a lot of questions privately um, in email and DMs and other places. And we realized that like, this is a kind of a new thing. It's kind of different. We want to take a little time to really talk with more openly about the decisions, how it's gone, what we're trying to do next, and hopefully share what we've learned along the way. Sound what good? Do you think? Should we jump into the first question? Let's here? do it. So we've got a bunch of questions coming in. If you have questions throughout, um, hit the ask a question button and it'll make its way through to us. Um, we'll try to call it your name, assuming that we know what it is and it isn't some um, secret name that you've used on the internet. Um, <laughs> but we'll start with the first question. So the first question is from Sai, which is, how did the team take the news when they heard the news? How involved were they in the decision? So that's a great question and it's, it's interesting. So we decided last summer, probably in June, um, that we didn't want to sell the company and that we really wanted to build something lasting. And we'd always kind of felt that, we'd always, we'd always wanted to do that. Um, somewhere in our hearts, we've always wanted to do that, but we weren't super clear about that. Like people would always ask us, oh, with Wistia, what are you trying to do? Like, are you trying to, you know, tell, tell me what the exit strategy is. And we would always say, oh, there's kind of like three things. We could be a large private company, um, we could sell the business, or maybe we could raise like a lot of money and we don't know what will happen, but like that's another option. So we kind of were always going through in that mode. Um, and then when we really came to terms with this, and realized that we just love running this company and we want to try to do it for as long as we can. Um, we felt like instantly that we were actually misaligned with investors in, in a way and with the team, we wanted to be clear with them. And so we, Brennan and I had been across the street uh, sitting on a uh, loading dock of a pharmaceutical company <laughs> as we figured this out and we thought, let's just get the company together. So we got everybody together and told them the story of this. Um, and then as we... And that, but that was before yeah. we decided to raise debt. Yes, yeah, so we, we didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't, we didn't know that piece. Um, we just knew that we weren't going to sell the business. Yeah. Um, and that, but that was an important step for us because like Chris said, that was always something that was like on the horizon or people would ask and we would just say, oh, never say never. I, I don't know. That's not our intention, but you never know. Yeah. And then it was probably 
four months later, four or five months later, where we figured out what we were gonna do, which was we're gonna raise debt, we're gonna offer the same deal to everybody. Um, we'd realign everybody through this that we actually told everybody. And then the reaction at that time, I, I would say was confu like excitement and confusion. Um, like, well, I just asked right before this because, I mean, we, we have our impression of how it yeah. went, but I just we just asked Chris and Maria, and I feel like the, their, what they said is, is like a good representation of the team, which is like really proud in what like affirming like Wistia as a creatively driven company and what the future is, but also this like fear and uncertainty around the debt. Is this accurate, Maria? It's it just like, it's she a spoke. different. <laughs> We've done it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different path. It's not as well understood, um, like especially in the world of tech. And so I, we wrote about this in the post, but when we raised the debt, when we did that at that moment, we were not profitable as a company. And we are, you know, open books here. We talk about our financials internally. So everyone on the team knew that. So in the moment where we're saying we're going to raise $17.3 million in debt and we're not profitable, you can understand how that's like a slightly- A little bit stressful, yeah. Concerning thing. And, and the reason we felt comfortable with it is because we had looked really closely at the way the business was performing and what the future looked like. And I mean, it's a nice piece of having a, a, a software as a service business that you have this annuity. So we felt really confident in that, but it's like, it's not until I think, um, we we became profitable that the team really saw that that then it started to feel a lot more comfortable yeah i think it was like the unknown was scary we were excited not just about the idea of doing the buyback but also about the idea of having the right constraints on the company i remember when we saw this option we're like well this is going to force us to be profitable if we're gonna we're not going to be able to like move away from that position and that is actually helpful because we had seen in the past that when we said we need to be profitable to survive, it was actually not that hard to stay motivated and focused on doing that. And so that was that was another piece of it. We we kind of felt like doing the deal would help us, would help cement the path we wanted to um, be on. Yeah, which was also an odd thing because we also, you know, I think it's it's easy to get a lot of advice, and we had certainly received that, and we talked about this in the post of spending money to grow, and that if we had these constraints, it might limit us in what we were able to do, and we kind of like instinctually saw those limits as really beneficial because that meant we wouldn't have to like really ever have that conversation. It would just be embedded in the company. Um, but that that came up when we talked to uh, investors about this deal. That was a big concern that they had. Yeah, well, going to the next question from Jeff. Gif, Jeff, how do you pronounce that? I would Maria? Say, I would say Gif. <laughs> yeah. Gif says, a, yeah. I was interested in your structure. You raised debt, but I assume it didn't completely buy out your investors. I'd assume there was just enough to shift them to passive uh, common shareholders would love to learn more. So yeah, basically we did a pretty simple thing, which was we said um, to investors and to the team, like this, these are the terms. You can do this if you want to. You don't have to do it. We did something called a tender offer, um, which I had not, I didn't really know what this was before, but the idea is it's one offer to everybody. People know what it is. It's to make sure that it's extremely fair. Everyone has the same information. You send the same financials to everybody. So people are making a decision um, on their own with the same, with the same information. That's really important. Um, and then we basically gave them an option, which was you can try to you put in how much you want to sell. Uh, and some people wanted to be bought out completely. Some people didn't at all. Uh, some of the investors in particular didn't at all because they were just excited about the mode that we were going into. And I think that was one of the really interesting things um, and interesting learnings here is that, you know, a lot of angel investors, people who do this all the time, they are angel investors, they have a high net worth. And so when they are investing and they, they're like, well, I could get a return now, or maybe I'll get something in the far future. If, you, if they didn't feel like the investment was that big in the first place, it's kind of easy to keep it rolling. But it was it forced a moment that was a very concrete decision. Um, but what it, uh, we also, the, the investors used to have preferred shares, which basically means they have different rights um, and the rights are outsized relative to their ownership. So things like the ability to block a sale or block your raising money. And there's all this, you can look up preferred shares, there's a host of things that come with that. And so by converting to common shares and having everyone be on the same page, it meant that anyone who stayed in was gonna just be completely aligned with Brennan and I, which we thought was a good thing. Um, and forced people when they were thinking through, should they do this or not, to know like, all right, Chris and Brennan are trying to build this for the long term. I know what that is, if I wanna stay in, I'm in it for the long term. Yeah, I think that was a big one um, too. I don't know how much we talked about this in the post, but that 
are the investors that we have, we only have 13 angel investors or had 13 angel investors. And some of them are friends and family and the people who weren't friends are friends now. Like a lot of people, like it's a been a very supportive group. And with those preferred rights, there were something that they mostly didn't come into play. So a lot yeah. of it was like around signaling and like resetting of expectations with what we wanted to do for the uh, with the business for the long term. And so by changing from preferred to common, that was also us saying to them and being really clear, like, hey, like if if we make money from this business, you will make money in the same way. We're not too we're not like adversarial. We are like the same. It's like the same now. Um, and I think like so far that's worked really well and people understood that. I think people asked different questions when we went through and offered this and, I, and the questions were interesting because they were much more, um, like I think what one of the investors said to me at one point, they're like, so basically if we stay in, we are just like, we're trusting you and Brendan. I'm like, yep, that's it. Which you would think that that's normal in when you have like an angel investor that there's that level of trust. But the reason that you have so many controls and rights and stuff is because it's so easy to get burned, I think, in like, especially like early stage companies. Um, so it was, a, it was an interesting thing for us. And since we've been on this path, um, it's, I, we've already seen the alignment, which is great. All right, next question. Maria, why don't you want to answer any questions? This is from Charlie. Maria? <laughs> I just don't want to take any shots out of you. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Maria. Uh, next question, also from Charlie. Uh, how, how much did your families or trusted outside of, advisors factor into these decisions? That's a great question. It is a great question. We, um, I think in, I keep saying this over and over, in the post, we did describe this like existential turmoil that the two of us were in. And in that was, I don't know how long, it felt like a year period, but it's mm -hmm. probably just like two weeks. I don't know. No, it was more than, a month. it was more, yeah. It was, it was, I would say it was two months, two to three Rough months. Two to three rough months, sleepless months. But the, during that time, we were constantly reaching out to people who've helped us over the years, who we respected, fr friends and family and advisors to talk through this situation. Because it was, I mean, it's one of the biggest decisions that we have made in our lives. And we were obviously struggling with it. Um, and one thing that was not what I expected um, was that if you, are, if you have a business and you're considering a sale, uh, for what will be a life-changing amount of money for you and your family. No person, uh, no matter how trusted and good friends they are with you, wants to be the person who's standing in the way of that. Uh, some, a, a, a friend of ours uh, gave us really good advice with someone who sold a business, um, this guy Jason Eckenroth, and he, he went through the same thing and he was like, it was really weird to me when this happened and he likened it to, if a friend is getting married and you think they're marrying the wrong person, like you might say, oh, like, uh, are you, you know, are you sure? But then you want to be supportive in their decision and that like, it's a really happy, good thing for the most and part. And you assume you don't know everything. Exactly. Like, oh, it must, yeah. the relationship must be different when I don't see it. Or like, there must be some other aspect to this that's really good. And it's, I think it's, you know, we asked for a lot of advice and people are like, you should do it. Yeah, we were expecting people, especially people who had, you know, large independent businesses, uh, who were really like cheerleaders of like the bootstrap. We expect them to tell say, us not to sell. Don't do it. And like, everybody never do it. Yeah. And most people said you should sell, but or no, they didn't say you should they'd be like, you should take this really seriously. This is a really serious thing, which it was. Um, and I think it was after the fact, when we went back to those people and told them we'd made this decision and what we were doing, they're like, Yes, that's amazing. That's so great. But I, I think it is because it is so deeply personal, and I think there's a lot of reasons why, um, if Brendan and I weren't as aligned as we are about what we what we like doing with our time, which is basically this, then we it wouldn't have made sense to do what we did. I think it was just because we, we truly enjoy it. We're both so aligned. How how much of an inside look is this? Is like the full inside look. I feel like one other funny thing that happened during this uh, is so we've been friends for a long time, and our wives are very good. We're all very good friends. They we they saw Help, us struggling. I helped you move that piece of furniture last night. Chris helped me move a dresser last night. And we went um, rock climbing this morning. Yeah, so put that. Think nice. about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I remember true. we were like we were deliberating about. That this thing was heavy. I don't know how you thought you were going to do that yourself. Yeah, it's good <laughs> to have friends. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were like in this like angst, like not sleeping well, to talking about the decision. I just remember my wife, Juliana, was like, oh, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> I was like, what do, you, what, what do you mean? Like, we're like seriously concerned. She's like, no, you and Chris, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> and I feel like Zan was like, 
She's, yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're there's no way. Yeah. Well, they know better than us, don't they? That is true. Um, so how much did they factor into the outside decisions? They factored in, love advice, um, but it's a, it's a hard thing to get advice on, I think. Well, and the overriding advice was, it's a deeply personal decision. Yes. So. Yeah. 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 Next question from Brian. Any plans to bring back Wistia Fest in 2019? Um, great question, Brian. For those who don't know, we did Wistia Fest for uh, as our annual conference for about five years. Um, we didn't do it this year because uh, we wanted to change things up a little bit. Um, so we don't know yet. I think what we were, are going to do is I, I'm not going to promise that we'll bring anything back that's in a particular way. But what I will say is that we are we're trying more and more ways to um, connect to the community, do it more often. This is an example of this CouchCon, which we did last week, which was really fun. Um, is another example. We did Video Marketing Week in um, May, and we have more events like this coming, and we're excited to do more ongoing events. I think one of the things is with Wistia Fest over the years, we got so um, we loved Wistia Fest so much, and it was like one of really one of my favorite days of the year. It's just this enormous high to be with all the same people who care about the same thing. Um, but also a lot of the feedback from Wistia Fest that people told us was, we love how small it is. We love it's for, that it's 400 people. We capped it at 400 people. And it started to feel funny to have this event that was only 400 people when the scale of the business had grown so much. Um, and we didn't have a good way with engaging people remotely and kind of expanding the audience. And so um, we, we're, we're thinking more about that for the future. So I would say Wistia Fest as it was not coming back uh, next year, but we'll have more things that are designed to bring the community together. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think the thing that was so, at the the virtual events, and we want to do more of them, and they're really fun, and the, it gets to a, a whole different audience in, a, in a, a scale that we couldn't achieve with an in-person event, but there is still also no substitute for the type of energy you get from being with people in person. I mean, we are, Yes. it's why we have an office <laughs> and have people working here in person. Um, we really love it. So I think we'll probably just have a hybrid of things yep. going forward. Yep. Next question from Steven. How do you find your customers or are they finding you? Well, Steven, that's a great question. Um, today, most of our customers come to us through the content we make, through word of mouth, through searching directly through Wistia. Um, we've tried a lot of stuff over the years to kind of get the, the company, the brand out there, the products out there. And it's funny, but we keep relearning the same lesson, which is like, if you focus on really making a great product that's actually useful, like truly useful to people, um, and then you focus on just really your existing customers and making the experience for existing customers really incredible, um, which comes for us, that's through our support, through sales, through the product updates, through our beta program, through events, through tons of different stuff, that if we do that, we. Uh, end up usually generating enough word of mouth and people continue to talk about Wistia and that's how the word gets out there. Um, there's been spikes over the years of different things, but for the most part, it's pretty simple. Um, try to teach people what we're learning and hope that it's genuinely useful. Yeah, and being, I think, um, I mean, it was a number of years ago that we got really serious about content marketing. And for us, the flavor of that is teaching people um, you know, we started with DIY video tips. And so we take that really seriously and treat it like a, like we treat the product, basically, like a big investment in that and making sure stuff is really valuable and high quality because that's I just, I don't, it feels like the right way to do marketing um, and like, and build a brand. I think it's also interesting because when we first started doing that, we believed that it was gonna work, but it didn't actually show up in the numbers for a while. Like, I think we probably spent, it was, about two years of making content on a weekly basis before you could go in Google Analytics and be like, most of the people who are coming here are becoming coming because of this. Mm -hmm. Which is funny, because like from the first post, you can remember the comments and the feedback and people yeah, mentioning like- the anecdotal evidence. Yeah, we get Very so fast. much anecdotal yeah. evidence, but it's actually, it can feel hard to make that decision to keep doing something when all you get is anecdotal evidence. Um, and if anything, that's a lesson, which is like, I think relevant to any business, not just like content marketing, but like actually listen to the qualitative stuff that people tell you. And it's, if you're doing something new, treat it like it's the quantitative stuff. Um, because it's often that's what you need to do something long enough to actually have it make an impact that you can that you can keep investing. Next. I'll read this one. Perfect. This question is from Dana. 
As a fellow startup founder, I was excited to hear about your bootstrapping rethink and move to a profit sharing program. Been looking at building such a program myself. Can you share how you set it up and suggestions on what to think about? It's a great question. Great question. So new for us too. Um, so this is obviously <laughs> new. So this is the first year. So we did something pretty simple, which is we took a percentage of EBITDA, um, which I hope you know what that means. But if you don't, it's earnings before. Actually, why would you know that? We didn't, I didn't know this. Fact, <laughs> right? It's, right, Maria? Uh, <laughs> which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, it basically, it's like you, your profit before you have to pay interest on debt or taxes because you're profitable or all the other like amortization on other things that are you know capital expenditures things like that um so we took a percentage of that and we said this percentage is just going to be for the team and people are going to participate in it based on how they're already compensated through their salary so it's going to look like a bonus um and we did that for a few reasons like one we wanted to be really simple uh so that everyone would know what it was and what to expect Two, we work really hard to pay people equitably. So we are, um, as we do, we do reviews twice a year, and as we're doing that, we're always auditing people's compensation to make sure that people are paid fairly across demographics of all kinds. And so it felt like we're putting a lot of work to make sure that people are people are paid equitably and they're rewarded for the work that they're doing. And so tying the profit sharing to compensation seemed like a smart idea because we would benefit from that work and that and that fairness. Yeah, it was though we went round and round on all kinds of different uh, versions of this because we were, um, I mean, one nice thing about equity is, you know, as the value of the business increases, like people share in that and just and that feeling of ownership, we wanted that to be replicated. But one of our core values is simplicity too. And we were coming up with all these like, super complicated crazy schemes that were just really hard to understand and that was one actually thing we talked a lot about that um you know if, if you're a company that that gives out stock options you've probably found this to be true that unless people are really well versed in how they work uh it's really confusing it's a pretty well, so, confusing yeah. compensation mechanism and with the profit sharing it was nice because it's just like the business is profitable we make money we take a portion of that and uh, we pay it out to everybody based on your, you know, pro rata based on your salary. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it is interesting how confusing it is because we were spending a lot of time like talking through like, okay, what's the strike price mean? How are valuations set? How often are they set? Does it matter if you came, if you came like a week before the strike price changed, it's very different than if you came a week after how many total outstanding standing shares are there? Like, I, I think it's, it's so confusing the yeah, stock option model. Yeah. I. Uh, I did have one job uh, before starting Wistia out of, out of college. I remember I received, actually I was going, I was cleaning out this dresser that Chris helped me move the other day and I found my stock options from this company. And I remember when I got them, I was just, I just didn't really understand how they worked. And so I just kind of treated them as like, you know, not value, as like, well, whatever, this is, these are not gonna be that valuable. Which is also a funny thing too, in that if you're giving out something that is of course really valuable to the company, but the people that you're hiring, uh, you know, have like varying like degrees of like savviness in this and value them completely differently. That seems like kind of like inefficient and messed up to well, me. Well, it just seems wrong. I, I think that's, because as much as you try to educate about it, it's just, you know, it, like I remember having conversations with people three years ago. And I was like, well, if we keep the revenue growth rate at, the, at like 50% or 100% or whatever, then we think that our valuation, if we sold, would be this multiple. So it's multiple layers of things that you're like guessing at. And of course, if there's a market change at any moment, that affects you in that way. And just for a private company, I think that's that gets a little scary because then everyone's like, well, what's the what's the outcome? And I'm like, well, I don't know. So you just told me there's like two inputs and you don't know what the outcome is. Like, I think it's I think it is a confusing thing, which is how we how we settled on this. And it's also interesting because you know, there's, we talked to a lot of other private companies about how they handle this problem mm -hmm. and they do profit sharing or things like it. And so it's actually a very known quantity um, in many, many industries. I just think it hasn't been as popular in, in tech. Um, yeah, all right, we can spend more time on that, but we won't. Colin, question from Colin. How much or little um, did external forces concern you and play into the decision on taking that debt? So like the economy, life stages, uh, other events that were going on. Um, 
not that much, I, I'd say. I feel like when we, the, the piece that was like the hardest that caused a lot of the stress, um, it all kind of went away when we reaffirmed the reason that we were doing this in the first place. Um, and that had nothing to do with, yeah, the economy or any, I, I mean, we certainly thought about that. We we're like, well, this is gonna look pretty, we're gonna look pretty dumb if like we do this and then <laughs> we, can't, we can't make a profitable business and it all, I mean, that was to, to Maria's question about, or thing about like the debt being scary. I mean, we, we considered that, but um, I'd say the overriding piece was, was what, like what we thought was it could become and why we were doing it. Well, it was also funny because we, I think that I agree with everything Brendan just said, and I would just add on to it. Like, we thought if we do this and it doesn't work, if, we, if you can't get the business profitable mm -hmm. enough, then the, basically you have to sell the company, which is what we were faced with before in the first place, which would have been really bruising from like an ego perspective. But the macro level reality would be, we, we talked a lot about like taking care of the team and taking care of investors through the deal so that if things went sideways, it was the two of us that were like bearing the risk. Um, and we hoped that things wouldn't go sideways. We believed in the business and we've been fortunate that already, like we see that they have not gone sideways. Um, but it was that that idea of like, okay, if the worst case scenario, is that so bad? Like, it'll be embarrassing, but that's, that's basically it. Um, well, I mean, that's like a really fortunate position to be in. Yeah. Where like, I, yeah, the worst case scenario of that is we're not gonna be destitute, you know? No. So that felt fine. Yeah. Next one. Do you wanna read this one? Because you can't, GIF? Your GIF? Which one are we on? Oh, wait, wait, I skipped one, I'm sorry. No, that says. No, this Aaron. Aaron, yeah. Oh, sorry, Aaron. Okay, can, this question is from Aaron. Can you talk a little about liquidation preferences? How did that affect uh, the investors' thoughts? Um, this, well, I think answer we should explain, two ways. explain yeah. liquidation preference probably. Well, also, I'm unsure. Do you think this means that debt is senior in the capital structure to equity? Or do you think it is getting at that liquidation uh, preference in an investment? I think it's the investors. Okay. Do you yeah. want to explain? Sure. That? So basically, liquidation preferences are something that is pretty normal for angel investments or venture capital investments where you're guaranteeing the investors a certain return. And so um, often, you know, when, 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 the, when people are struggling to get into deals, the liquidation preferences are lower. So uh, like you might have a one X liquidation preference. Or oh, that's like participating rights, right? That's, that's what that preferred share is. Yeah, so if you sell the company, then the preferred shareholders have the preference to get their money out before. So if you raise yes, the money- Yes, so if you raise like $20 million yeah. and you sold 20% of the company when you did that, then if you sell the company for $20 million, the investors get 20 million. Yeah, Even they though they own 20%, yeah. they, get, they get their, it's like the preference on their investment. Um, and sometimes what ends up happening is that investors ask for more liquidation preference. So they ask for like a 1X, 2X or a 3X. So you take 20 million in, so if you, yeah, if you took 20 million in uh, and they had a 3X participating rights and you sold it for 60 million, they would get all 60 million and the common shareholders or the founders of the team would get nothing. Yes. So it, that, okay. which is something to be very aware of because also while we're on this, I think like if you're in the position that you're dealing with liquidation preferences, the way that it's often sold is like, they'll say, we need a two or three X return on this. And you're like, oh, well, I can get the value of the company to be two or three X higher. And I'm like, okay, great. So then it shouldn't be a problem if we do the liquidation preference. So it's kind of like, if, if you go back to the $100 million valuation as an example, like $100 million, 20 million with three X liquidation, what you're really doing is today selling 60% from effectively, like if you sold the company, the investors get 60 million and the founders yeah. and employees get 40 million. But then over time, as the, as the value goes up, that 60 million stays the same amount until it's beyond 300. Yeah. We're using big numbers here, so I realize. Just say, that. yeah, if you're really successful, it won't matter, and that's true, but I think a lot of a lot of outcomes in in this space are, are there's very few that are really, really successful, so I think that's something to watch out for. But in, in our case, the way that we dealt with that, and we did, we had we moved the preferred to common, is because when we, we raised that money so long ago that the valuation of the company was like way at that, Fortunately, it was way past what the valuation was when we raised the money, so the investors weren't concerned about that. Yeah, so it, it, I think, yeah, for that reason, it made it easier for us. And then 
I think um, Aaron was also asking about what it's like working with AKKR, um, which I think has been great. I, you know, it's the thing that's very different about debt is that you're really structuring the relationship up front. You're saying what everybody wants really, really clearly up front, which limits the upside of the debt holders in a way that would not be the case with equity. Yeah, and it's it's very much managed by the numbers in a way that has been good for us. Like yeah. that's what we wanted and yes. signed up for. So like the business is performing well, great. Like that's- You know what the constraints yeah. are in a very, very clear way, which I think is just very different. Um, you know, AKKR and people like them if they're doing a, de a debt deal and you know, are they're not looking for control of your business. They're looking very discreetly for a financial return. And so if you have, um, if you're hitting the covenants that are all set up and you understand what those things are and you've modeled them out, then you can have, the, the relationship is just very, very clearly defined in a predetermined way, which is just very different than equity. And not, it's, not, it's not like we're against equity at all. Like that's how we were able to build this business. There's tons of businesses that have like the, they're, they're really a binary outcome where it's either gonna be, um, you're gonna be like wildly, wildly successful, you're gonna fail. That's where venture capital works really well, right? Like venture capital people, if you follow enough investors, they talk about like trying to get into a, enough deal flow to get into enough companies so they end up with an outlier. It's like something that's 25X better than anything else. Then you put more money into that thing and you hope that that one 25X thing is going to return your whole fund. And as an investor, that's a smart way to do it. I think as an entrepreneur, the question is, are you the 25X or are you all the others? Right, you and only have one company. You have one company. And so I think that the reason why it's, it, it can be a challenge is if you're setting up your funding and your company structure in a way where it can only work in a binary outcome, you might actually have found an amazing business to run, but that business might be a $10 million a year business or a $25 million a year business or even a $100 million business um, that you are having fun, you could actually have fun running it and you could take care of customers really well, you could take care of the team, but it's that still, maybe because of the time it takes to build it, isn't a good venture return. And so I think for us, like this deal is about getting us back into that place where it's like, all right, we can build any business we want and feel good about it and feel like everyone's taken care of and aligned with where we're going. And I think it is interesting to think about what are the other options that are out there to allow companies to have more optionality. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, to what Chris said, we're not, you know, like not like anti-VC or against that type of investing. Raising money for your business in any form, it's a tool to, to achieve something that you want. And like our hope with writing about this and doing this Q&A is that the, a lot, it's, it's an uncommon path that we're on of using debt to, to buy back investors and kind of switch paths. Um, but the more options people have and they know how it works, we think that's a, it's a good thing. All right, that was a good answer. We did a great job there, Brennan. Don't yeah, you think, Maria? I'd say that was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was all right. All right, um, did any, next question from, from Jeff. Did any investors try to block this and was anything really hard about making this change? Great question. No. no. <laughs> Well, no one tried to block no it. No one tried to block it. I, I would say it was when we, it was hard to find this option in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, yeah, par partially because also that network and a lot of our advisors didn't have much familiarity with debt um, or, or this because it was a pretty different and new thing. So when we said that we weren't gonna sell, the first place we looked was equity investment. So a typical thing is you'd bring in maybe longer range or more passive equity investors who have a longer time horizon. And that was, we got a lot of advice around that and we started going down that path. But we, we I remember a conversation with uh, someone where we, we were like, this is the last deal. We don't want to do any more deals. We don't want to do any more. We want to do one. And then the nice thing about debt is you do it and then you, you pay it back. And then that's it. You don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to. But with that, it, you have new investors who eventually, even if they have a longer time horizon, they will eventually need uh, a return. So I don't think anyone, uh, I think it made sense to people when, once we found it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it made sense. I think it was also like a communication challenge. Like that was hard, figuring out how to communicate this because you hear about like somebody being in debt or a company being in debt seems like a bad thing. Like at least to me it did. And then realizing, oh, well, it depends on how profitable you are, how confident you could be in being profitable. 
Um, and then we started looking and realizing that tons of public companies use debt all the time. And actually, it's often a really cheap way to get capital because if you have a stream of revenue that's coming in that's consistent enough and predictable enough, then debt doesn't feel as scary. Um, but we, you know, we're we're small, we're not a public company. And so th those were things that we weren't really thinking about. We had to like get versed on. Um, and then we had to figure out how to, how to actually communicate that. Yeah. And that was something that we struggled with too, when we wrote that post and, and sending it out, um, to customers too, that, that knee jerk reaction could be debt is scary, which now, um, and really grateful for all the support that we've yes. got on it. Thank it's you. clear that that message resonated, which I, we're really glad that it did. Because the funny thing is now kind of like being on both sides of this a little bit, if um, it, like when people raise uh, a big venture investment, it's it's fu like it, a lot comes with like it's very celebrated usually in the community and it like, you know, it, sh it should be, but also comes with like a whole set of things of this like really like going into like this like hyper growth mindset that tends to shift uh, like not good or bad, but just different like culture and the way that a company operates and how it interacts with its its customers, um, in a way like, but it's like almost universally viewed as good. So we were we were worried with the debt piece that it would be like, oh, debt bad. Like, what is happening to Wistia? Are they in like dire straits? But really, for us, it was like we were really proud of it um, and felt that it would enable us to to serve customers and to do our best our best work yeah. in a way that the other the other wouldn't. It's just another. It's just another option, and I think so often, like the stories, we have worked hard to talk to other companies that are private companies that have done really well that nobody knows about, and there are so many of them out there. It's ridiculous, and part of the reason no one knows about it is like they're not doing funding announcements that are getting written up for that reason, and also often people don't want to know, and they don't want anyone to know that they're doing well because then they're going to have more competition and they're going to like. It's like, a, it's so it is a funny thing of like realizing that there's all these other great companies or even the trade-off between um, running at a lot. Like we, there's a lot of advice that you can look up. Like I saw someone tweet some advice the other day about this. It was like, oh, if you're growing and you're profitable, like, you know, push the company a little bit harder. Like d get rid of that profit. There's probably more growth for you to find, which kind of makes sense in a world which is obsessed with funding. It's like, take every dollar and put it back in. And I think that one of the lessons for us is like, we effectively did that for two and a half years. We like used the fact that we had cash on hand to like run at a loss. It's like we raised money and watched it break a bunch of stuff that was actually critical to what we do. So I think it, it just depends on the company. Like for some companies, they obviously have to raise tons of money to grow and be successful. And that's great. And if you're in one of those companies, that's what you're doing, you know what you're signed on for, and that's the strategy, fantastic. I think the thing that's funny is that there's so many other counter examples now that we've seen that are like companies that are really profitable and growing really well. And you know, they found the same thing. When they lose focus, mm -hmm. that's when they're screwed. It's like, um, so it's, that was a long answer, but I, I think that's why the structure is so important and like thinking through these, these questions is so important. All right, uh, next question from Neil and Jana. You alluded to a steep learning curve about compensation and equity as founders and having to learn about things like EBITDA. What resources would you recommend to prospective employees of any company who are considering an offer including equity? Mm. That is a great question. Actually, our very own uh, Robert Grossman, who's a VP of engineering here, uh, he wrote a really good, this was like many years ago, really yeah. good blog post on like assessing um, uh, an offer from a company that includes options and like what all the terms mean and how to like break it down and think about it. And that was something that we would send people when we were offering um, that if they wanted to talk about it, which was helpful. So we'll, what we'll, will we we'll, do? We'll, we'll share the this, link. We'll share the link. We'll share the link to, share the link to, to Robbie's post. Yes. Um, but a few shorthand things you can do. Ask, so ask how many, like, sh how many shares there are total. Figure out what percentage of the company you own that are, are going to have the option to own and figure out what the strike price is. So that's basically, the company is always being valued and there's a strike price on the shares. And let's say the strike price, if you think shares are, if the strike price is 50 cents, and then you can later have the option to buy your shares and sell them for a dollar, mm -hmm. you can make 50 cents a share. 
But if the strike price is 50 cents and later you have the option to buy and sell your shares for 50 cents, then you don't make anything. You could do some back of the envelope math and try to get a sense of like, all right, well, they've told me it's 10,000 options, but what does 10,000 options mean? Um, like how much do I have to pay to get these? What does that mean about the valuation of the company? And what does that mean for um, overall ownership? Yeah, and I think one other piece that is easy to miss too, and some companies, uh, there's been a trend to doing this, which I think is really helpful. If you are at a company, some of your options vest, and you and you leave that company, um, off the typical terms are you have 90 days or something like that to exercise them, which means then you need to pay money to buy the shares from the company, otherwise you lose them. Which is like not great because you've earned, like that's part of your compensation, you've earned it. So there's like been a trend towards increasing that time period and that's something I would take a look at if you're, if you're thinking about joining a company that gives you equity. Yeah, just ask a lot of questions. I think that's like, the people who ask a lot of questions in that process are going to benefit far more. And if you're asking questions and a company doesn't want to give you the answer, you're going to learn something. Yeah, it could be a good signal. Yeah, it could be a good signal you're going to learn about that, that company yeah. as well. All right, this question is from Drew. Hey guys, love you both in Wistia. Thanks, Thanks Drew. <laughs> 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 Were you two always very entrepreneurial? And what was it like in the beginning phases trying to grow the hustle, the grind? And did you have to absolutely raise capital as opposed to building software on your own and trying to get customers? Thank you. Well, Drew, that's a great question. Um, so Brent and I met in college. We lived in the same freshman dorm. Unit 9, what what, at Brown. Um, <laughs> shout out. Shout out to Unit 9. Um, and I would say, like, at least for us in our partnership, we were always like scheming on things, like get rich quick schemes and things like that that we never did, but we schemed on them. Um, and it was funny, we, there were signs of things that we did that now looking back, I'm like, oh, that was sick. Like in college, Brendan made this website called Voxus. It was basically it was great like, website. it was great. It was a great website, <laughs> totally hand coded. Did every icon of that thing. It was basically a blogging platform before there were blogging platforms that was not open to anyone else. So this was never truly, no one could use this except for us. But I remember that coming out and it was like sick. We had a launch party and we talked about a lot and there was like a lot of writing on there. Um, a lot of cool t-shirts. A lot of cool t-shirts. Um, I was doing films, so we worked on a lot of films together and you know, coming up with concepts of films and um, trying to figure out how to like tell stories like back in the day. So we were always working on stuff like this yeah, there was a lot of, probably the actual was a lot of creative projects yeah. and expenditure versus things that made business sense. None but. of them made business sense, <laughs> I, but it, we, there was a lot of that. Um, and the early days were honestly really fun. I mean, we were in a 10 person house here in Cambridge because um, it was like the cheapest option we had of where to live. We were working every day in the house. Um, sharing food with everybody in the house, living like we were literally spending $15 a week on food because we convinced everyone that they should chip <laughs> in and we had every meal at home and they had like, Maybe you know, dinner, a, a dinner every other night. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I think it was really fun for a lot of reasons. Like we were learning so much, we could, we could build whatever we wanted to build. We could be wrong and it was fine. Um, and it was also super nice to have like a social network that we didn't have to work for. Like a lot of people told us like, you're gonna have to sacrifice something. You're gonna have to sacrifice, and people say this, the hustle, like you're gonna, oh God, you're gonna have to your sacrifice relationships, your friends, yeah. your family, all this stuff. And I don't know if that would have been true if we weren't in that house, but because we're in that house, the moment that we were like, we shouldn't be like, I need to take a break, there was like people to hang out with. And so there was con this like constant, um, this constant network that was there that was really helpful and made it easier to get through. Um, and I think even it took us, it took us a year to make our first dollar, but in that first year we did launch some stuff and some of the stuff took off and it made no money, but we were able to actually get some like pretty huge endorphin hits probably. I mean, ironing the flag was like, in, yeah. was like two months in, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also say, I feel like we were pretty fortunate to find out early on in that first year that just the act of doing it and working together was really fun and rewarding, even though we really did not have any financial success. What's the opposite of financial success? We were basically in financial ruin as a result of this, but we, it was so fun and we were like, we really want to continue to work together. And I think part of that recognition helped build a better kind of balance, like work-life balance piece. Because in the moments where we were really stressed about doing, like we didn't really, I feel like we didn't really have those. I mean, we, they're stressful moments obviously, but that we made time for other things and that was something that was always important to us. I remember there was things that were like 
we we used to talk about whether or not we know we know like quote business. Do you remember that? Like we were like we had a um, we almost did a deal with HBO at one point, and it's a long story. Yeah, how much time do we have? We didn't, can't tell uh, that story. It's too long. That <laughs> needs its own hour. But uh, um, we were on the phone with the people who had introduced us to this deal, and this was like just when Wistia was like really starting to roll, and like we got our first paying customer, second paying customer. Now we're talking to HBO. And we but like, still at the time we had no website. No you website. Yeah. Com, yeah. It just said hello, I think. Yeah. But we had yeah, we had this first version of the software and we had people using it and paying for it. Yes. And we would be on the phone and people would say stuff about like things we should do to negotiate. And we'd like cover up our physical phones we we're using. I'd be like, is that is this what business is like? Like, should we really do this? Like, is this a good thing to do? Is this business? Like, there was a lot of like, is this business? Can you do this? And it took a, it actually took a while. I almost like probably six years before we realized, oh, being persistent matters, and doing it your own way matters. Like, just be willing to do it your own way, um, because you're gonna you're gonna learn so much, and there is no set rules. Like, that's kind of that's what makes it fun. If there were set rules, we wouldn't be doing it. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, did we have to raise capital? No. No. We we did it so that we could hire faster. I think we would have survived. We definitely would have survived had we not done it because we were cash flow positive when we did that. I don't know that Wistia would be like the size or scale or we would have, have like dreamt as big as we have. Um, maybe we would have. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I think we were able to hire two amazing people who helped us a ton. We were able to get some people who cared about the business who were really good advisors. It also caused us to make a bunch of mistakes, but that seems normal. Um, so I don't think we had to, but I think it was in our case, it was helpful. All right, um, from Andy, for startups that can't bootstrap and need some funding to get off the ground initially, what alternative fun funding models would you suggest founders use instead of traditional VC or angel investment terms? This is a great question. Um, there are more options out there that you sh I suggest to, like you look at. Um, so Indie VC, uh, if you haven't seen them, you should definitely look them up. They have a really interesting option where um, there's basically similar to, there's an equity component, but similar to debt, there's a way that you know how you're going to buy back the equity. Um, that's really interesting. Um, there's another uh, firm called RevUp that does a very similar model. I think it's only a debt focused thing that is for early, really early stage companies, companies that have like 10 to $40,000 a month in MRR. Um, so those are worth checking out. I just invested in a company called Spark Turo that's run by Rand Fishkin, who used to, was a founder of Moz. And he came up with a way of structuring the deal that was kind of similar, like basically, um, instead of shares, there's like credits in the company. And then everybody is guaranteed their investment back. And then beyond that point, there's a cap on the salaries of the founders. And once they are at that cap, the only way that they can take more money out of the business is by effectively issuing what's called a dividend. So like sending money to all owners in the company, um, which they would also receive, which is an interesting model. I would say be really clear with any of your investors what you're trying to do. I think we were fortunate because we told our investors in the early days, we were terrified of, of losing their money. And so we told them, if you can't afford to lose this, do not invest in us. And I think that that paid off in that they really were patient. Like the only people who ended up investing in Wistia were here for over eight or nine years, right? That's a long time. Um, and I think that you can, you can do funding in a traditional way, but be super clear. And I would even consider having the conversation of, what would it take for us to buy you out? Like, what would it look like? What would you be happy with with an investment here? And what is your time horizon? I mean, it, you need to be, as an entrepreneur, it feels really funny because you, are trying so hard to get people to invest in your company, but the second that people will start wanting to invest, now it flips around, you have to evaluate them, and evaluating who you're partnering with is so critical. And if you do have a company that can raise money, you're probably already in the rare echelon of companies. So now that you're there, recognize that you're there and ask ask hard questions so you know who you're getting into business with. Yeah, I think that is good advice. It's it's funding is something that's really challenging to undo as evidenced by <laughs> all of this that we just did. And you're signing up for a partner for a really long time and being clear about what you want. I mean, the other thing to say, I think that maybe people don't admit that often is it's okay to not know what you want. That is what we did not know what we wanted for uh, more than a decade. Um, 
And one thing that we were fortunate to have, I think, in some of the early uh, advisors and investors is they were pretty, uh, they were helpful in helping preserve optionality um, to the extent possible. And so even if you don't know what you want to do, just thinking through all of the possible outcomes and making sure that those things are possible to the extent you want them. All right, looks like um, we have just a couple more questions we're gonna go through quickly and then can we show some of the behind the scenes stuff? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, well we'll try to show some behind the scenes stuff of how we did this, right? You wanna do it now? Well, uh, let's go through these two quick questions then we'll do that. Okay. All right. Um, you guys have been working together for 12 and a half years and are still friends. How is this possible? How is it possible? How is it possible? Um, well, well, this is actually, this is, people have asked us that after writing this, a bunch of people have asked us this, I'd say privately, I don't know, se separately from not, not in the, the, the blog post or anything. So we've gotten this question a lot and not even, and just over the years. Uh, I guess a few things about this uh, that, that we feel pretty strongly about. When we first set up the business, we set it up as an equal partnership that we're 50-50 in doing this. We got a lot of advice that that was not what we should do, that we knew other companies who, you know, if it was my idea, then I'd have a little bit more, or Chris has slightly more experience, so he'd have more. We also had the, got the advice from, I think, a lawyer early on that having 50-50 is like really dangerous because if you disagree, we're gonna like stalemate the business or something so like stupid. that, which is the most insane uh, advice possible because if you have two people who are running a business in a partnership who don't agree, they should probably resolve that uh, disagreement. Yeah, it's like let's otherwise, go, yeah. the whole, it, there will be much greater repercussions than. It's like getting into business with an enemy. It's like let's set up the terms, but like you're my enemy, so like I better be able to like always up over you. Yeah, um, and the other piece that was maybe counterintuitive uh, is in doing this. We we were like Chris said, we were really good friends before we started the business, and I, I think it's common to have this conversation. We're like, all right, so you know, we're friends. We gotta compartmentalize our friendship and our business relationship, and you know, or saying like the phrase like it's just business as like code word for like I'm gonna be like a huge asshole now. I think we were always very clear of like our friendship comes first, and I think as a result of that, it made any you know like any time like we don't agree always, but like we'll be really quick to resolve those things because of the effects that that would have on our friendship. Where if it was business first, I think it'd be easier to, to it, I think it would just, it, it, you, people are people and a very yeah. we're two very emotional people. Very, and, very <laughs> emotional, yes. Um, and I, I don't know, that wouldn't, may, maybe there's someone out there who can, who can compartmentalize properly, but for us, the whole thing is really wrapped up together and being, having friendship first has been really important. Yeah, and I think it's like with any relationship, at some point you have to enter a level of trust where you actually give each other feedback and call each other on your stuff. And you have trust that you can do that and that it, the relationship will end up stronger. And because I think there is a tendency where people are friends and they don't want to step on each other's toes, um, which kind of makes sense. Like that's why, you know, I know many people who've started companies and I don't think that they focus as much on this. And then the friendship separated because it just became a work relationship. Um, and it's actually that those moments of like, hey, let's talk through this hard thing. Let's talk through the thing that we disagree on. And, or let me give you feedback. Right, because you works. actually care about the person yeah. and trust them. Which is scary, but it like, it, I think it's true in any relationship, like in a co-founder relationship, in a marriage, in a friendship, like it's those relationships that you really build um, trust in that you could actually give each other real feedback that are really valuable. Um, last question. Did the fact that other employees' lives might change material in a negative way from a sale impact the decision? That's a great question. We definitely talked about that a lot and we were very concerned about that. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why we felt like when we were doing the buyback, it was similar to as, as if the company had been sold from like a compensation standpoint, like people got what, you know, they were buying, we were buying back equity or buying back options. And so the hope was that we would be clear on that front. And then I think when you're trying to grow it and you're trying lots of new different things and sometimes old different things, you, you can send confusing signals to the team and to your customers and potential customers about who you are and what you're trying to do. And it, one of the things that was, we believed would happen is like the focus we would get 
after forcing ourselves to be profitable, being super clear about the strategy for the company would make it almost like, all right, everyone, this is the mountain we're climbing. And we've always been talking about mountain climbing, but now this is, we're climbing Everest, let's go. And that some people wouldn't like that because they didn't actually wanna climb Everest. And that was better for everybody to admit that and say that really clearly. And that the people who do wanna climb Everest are still here and are really like pumped about it. Um, so yeah, it, it factored in, but we felt like more important was the focus. Yeah, but I, I think also a lot of times when companies sell, you know, even if there's a good match of like company culture and things, it's different. And people joined your company and, to join your company, right? And so I think Wistie has always been a little bit different, um, especially in this area with the, the focus on creativity. That's not how every business is is structured. And that was something that we did think about. How, how can we have the outcome for the team, which is basically equivalent to if we sold the business, but continue um, doing what people signed up for? And so that felt really nice to be able to do that. So, so. Th thank you for the questions. We're gonna try to show a little behind the scenes in one minute. In one, is that a second or is that a minute? That's a second, give me one second. Oh, okay. for a second, hold on, we'll be right back. All right, here we are, Wistia live Q&A. Oh, wow. Hello. Here we got Brendan, Maria. Hi. Lenny under the table. All right, we are shooting everything on C200, some lights, then we got that running into the UTAP. We have a second camera up here for a wide angle and everything is running into OBS. So right now we're running the Wistia's Greatest Hits. It's about 30 minutes. Um, and I got a couple of scenes here. Got the intro video that's gonna hit, C200, Logitech camera, then a thanks for watching button. So hopefully it all goes according to plan. What's this? Break a leg. Uh, this is some diffusion paper. What? What? Does it have a technical? Uh... It's quarter white diffusion, quarter 251. White. Oh, that's what I'm looking Increasing for. the size of the source here. We have two Westcott LED flex lights back there. Oh, wow. How old is that? That's vintage, circa 2011, I believe. It's seen some stuff. Yeah, it looks like it's fallen over a number of times. All right, take care, good luck. We need Savage in the room. That would be, yeah, need him. Thank you everyone so much for coming to the Q&A today. We hope it was really helpful. Um, we're gonna try to do more stuff like this in the future on many different topics about working at Wistia, about how we make content, about lots of all different sorts of things. So we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, and, and thank you for the thoughtful questions. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Hope to see you soon. See ya. Have a great day. Bye. Say bye, Maria. Bye. Say bye, Chris. <laughs> Goodbye now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>